everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your... Well, happy Yom Teruah, 2015. And every year I, when I do these feasts, I've taught on them for many years, and I always want to come up with something new, or fresh, or, or something because it keeps it interesting for me and, and it just it mo interesting for you too, hopefully. And, and so I pray and I ask y'all, like, y'all, I don't know what, you know what to do, so give me some inspiration here. And I really do depend on him. So um, he gave me two fresh teachings this year that I haven't given before. And this teaching that I'm about to give right now, to be honest with you, uh, I can't believe I haven't given this teaching before because this is a fundamental doctrine of the faith. I'm okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll be okay for now. Um, and I want to teach on the resurrection. Not the resurrection of Yeshua, but the resurrection of the, the first resurrection, the, re the subject of the resurrection of the believers. And I don't think I've ever taught on this in all these years. I can't believe it. As we shall see a little bit later, it is one of the fundamental doctrines of the faith. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, it lists it. And as we will go a little bit later, we'll see that the resurrection is, is once one begins to, once one begins their spiritual journey after being called and converted, converted, the conversion process is a process, but they take those initial steps to move from the kingdom of light to the kingdom of the darkness, uh, kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and they make those initial confessions of Yeshua as their master and as their savior, and they go forward in those things. Their, their sins are washed away, and they put their faith in Him. Um, the resurrection is really the great hope, and the apostles. Uh, make that very clear. It is our great hope. And there's a very good reason for that. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to do a, I'm going to start at the beginning of the Bible and we're, we're going to take a quick look at m many, if not most of the scriptures in the Bible going in chronological order from the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation. What the scriptures say about the resurrection of the righteous. And even we're going to touch on the resurrection of the wicked as well. And, but mostly on the righteous. And um, we see as we go forward from Genesis on that the theme develops. And more revelation is brought forth. So it appears that as, as the subject unfolds in the Bible and as different authors discuss this subject, their understanding is expanded. And we see that in a lot of areas in the Bible. It's called progressive revelation. Now, there, let me just digress here. There's a good kind of progressive revelation, and there's a bad kind of progressive revelation. The bad kind of progressive revelation, let me put it this way. Let's do the first, the, let's, and before we do the counterfeit. The good kind of revelation, or progressive revelation, is Yah reveals truth as, as the scriptures go forward. And he adds more to what has already been given by divine revelation. And the new revelation does not cancel out, negate, abrogate the old revelation. It adds to it. It's an expanding picture. That's the good kind of progressive revelation. The bad kind of progressive revelation is humanism, the humanistic revelation, a uh, humanistic progressive revelation. And that's sadly what in, often we see in the mainstream church. Truth is revealed, but then the next truth cancels it out. And the next truth after that maybe cancels that out. We see that with, to a very large degree with the church's view of the Torah. 
Well, that was for the Jews or whoever back then. And, it, and then they, they come up with something different. And this cannot be because truth is truth is truth. Truth doesn't change. Truth is a straight line. Truth is a plumb line. Truth is a light, a laser light, and it doesn't curve unless acted upon by an outside source. That's, I think, one of the laws of physics. And that outside source is the devil or the mind of man. And that is not a good thing. All right. So we will see that it is progressively revealed as we go forward. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start in Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. I'm going to have Brother Jeff here read that, if he would. And the woman said to the servant, We are to eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, Do not eat of it, nor touch it, lest you die. All right. So... He Though this does not specifically speak about the resurrection of the dead, we see that right at the very beginning in the Bible, one of the very first conversations recorded in the Bible, if not the first conversation, there's a discussion of the afterlife. Way back at the very beginning of man's tenure on this earth, Eve and Adam and Eve and the serpent were discussing the afterlife. What happens when you die? Now, out, Yovah told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of life, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So out of fear of death, Adam and Eve chose not to eat of the tree of the knowledge until the serpent tricked them into disobeying Yovah's commandments. And then they ate of it. So the serpent lied to them by telling them that they could have immortal life and violate Elohim's commandments at the same time. And most men have believed this lie to this day, that you can have it your way. You really don't have to obey his commandments. And he doesn't really mean what he says, that when you eat it, when you sin, you shall die. When you go against my word, you shall die. Now let's go to Job 14. We're going to move through these pretty quickly. This isn't a comprehensive study, but it's a progressive, and it will give you, hopefully, a really good kind of a picture of this concept of the resurrection and the afterlife as we move forward. Job 14, 12 through 15. And man shall lie down and not rise. Till the heavens are no more, they awake not, nor are aroused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave, conceal me until your wrath turns away. Set me a time, and remember me. If man dies, would he live again? All the days of my struggle I wait till my change comes. You would call, and I would answer you. You have yearned for the work of your hands. Hallelujah. Many scholars believe that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Um, and if this is the case, we see, it certainly is a very old book, but it very likely predates the books of Moses, the Torah. And if, in any case, we see that Job, from the earliest times, man has had a perennial or constant interest in the afterlife. So we see here Job is wondering about what his fate will be when he dies. Will he die and that's all there is? Or is there an afterlife? The fear of death is the mother of all fears. Of all human fears, the fear of death is the mother of all fears. Just about every fear that human beings have, ultimately, would somebody let Luke in? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, the, the fear of death, it, literally almost all human fear 
can be taken back to um, the fear of death, ultimately. I learned this when I was in college and I was taking an advertising class uh, in my first year of college when I was studying journalism. And the fear of death, the advertisers, hello Luke, the fear of death uh, is a major motivation behind almost all Madison Avenue advertising. Uh, and then they, they use it in all kinds of things. You know, if you have bad breath, then you'll be rejected by your girlfriend or your wife. And, and then if you're rejected by them, you might be rejected and you can't get married and 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 maybe you'll be rejected by humanity because of your bad this is and, evol and to be rejected ultimately is to die you, nobody will want to be around you because you have bad breath so you need to buy whatever the the, the brand of mouthwashes they're trying to sell okay i learned that way back in college and so f the fear of death is really the mother of all fears ultimately all the fears go back to that so job was pondering this now go ahead and let's read Job 19, 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and as the last shall rise over the dust, and after my skin has been struck off, then in my flesh I shall see Eloah, whom I myself shall see on my side, and not a stranger. My kidneys have failed within me. So... This is a few verses later, a few chapters later. Job is a progressive book. And as he's going through the book, he's coming to uh, higher understandings. And of course, he has this great epiphany at the end uh, there uh, of his plight when Jehovah uh, reveals himself to him in a very unique kind of way. So here Job goes from a place of wondering what the afterlife is like and whether there is an afterlife, whether there's hope uh, in the resurrection or not, he comes to the place in his life where he's obtained a faith about his faith, in fate in the afterlife. He knows that somehow this his fate is it hinges on this redeemer. Now we we can look back, we all know who the redeemer is, it's Yeshua, the Messiah. And he does this is the first place in the scriptures where a, the term redeemer is used and is maybe the earliest if job is the oldest book in the bible it's the earliest uh, reference to that so there was a concept of the redeemer very very early on in, in ancient men and job really had a pretty profound understanding uh, at that early date so what is the mission of a redeemer we know that we know in hindsight that's referring to yeshua the messiah well, a redeemer is one who buys back or redeems somebody from the power of something else. That's the basic meaning of the word redeemer or to redeem. And in this case, we know, as we can look back and we can, we, we, we can go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and we see that the, uh, Yeshua came to redeem us from the sting of death or the sting, the sting of sin, which is death. And we know from the book of uh, Romans that the wages of sin is death. Uh, Ezekiel says, the soul that sins, it shall die. And so we know that the violation of Yehovah's of, of Torah, his laws, his commandments, his word, brings about death. Uh, that's why Yehovah told Adam and Eve, in the day that thou eatest of this fruit, you shall die. Now, they didn't literally die in that day, but they died in the first thousand years of the first spiritual day, if you will. But I will say that the moment they ate of that fruit, the process of dying took place in their body. They began to deteriorate. So the, the, it was very true, and the devil lied to them. Go ahead and read now. Let's move into uh, Psalms. And David has some additional understandings about, uh, about this concept of the resurrection. Now, the reason we're talking about the resurrection is today is Yom Teruah. And we, the most glorious thing that happens on this day, other than the appearing of Yeshua in the heavens, is the resurrection of the righteous dead to meet him in the air 
And that is our ultimate, I mean, that is our, our ultimate hope is to, well, that is our ultimate hope because once we cross over that threshold or that veil of death, we, and, and receive our glorified bodies, look, we have eternal life. That's the theosis. That's literally being brought into the, Paul calls it the adoption. He uses that term five times for being brought into the family of Elohim. To become a son of Elohim. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. As, as John said in his first epistle, the verse 2 of chapter 3. Yeshua, uh, or John says in ja- John chapter 1, I forget the verse, about 6 or so. says he's, Yeshua, he's given us, given, given us the power to become the sons of Elohim. The right, I think the, the Greek word is exousia there, literally the right or the privilege what a privilege. So this, this resurrection on Yom Teruah, we believe that it happens on Yom Teruah. I think there's quite a bit of general consensus on that among Hebrew roots teachers. This is an incredible hope. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 16, 9 through 10 now. Therefore my heart was glad, and my esteem rejoices. My flesh also dwells in safety. For you do not leave my being in the grave, neither let your kind ones see corruption. So, we know that this is uh, generally viewed as a messianic, one of the messianic prophetic words that refer to Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah. And he was not in the grave more than three days. For after three days, the body begins to deteriorate and rot and and decompose. So his body did not see corruption. And he resurrected before that chemical biodegradation process could take place. So while this is a prophecy about Yehovah's Kadosh One, the Kadosh One of Israel, Yeshua, we can also broaden this out to see that we, we, that this also applies to the saints. As the apostolic writers teach us, as Yeshua died and rose again, so the saints who are in Yeshua will die and rise again. And that's the hope that we have. And we'll tag some of those bases a little bit later as we move forward. Now, Jeff, Brother Jeff, will you please read uh, Psalm seventeen fifteen, our next verse. As for me, let me see your face in righteousness. I am satisfied to see your appearance when I awake. Now, awake is a Hebraism or a, or a metaphor for being resurrected from the dead. Because in Hebraic thought, when you die, you're sleeping. You're asleep. Now, yes, your body rots and goes back to the earth. But when you die, your spirit goes back to heaven. And we don't know what happens to it. The scriptures are very vague about that. But, at least for the righteous, it's waiting to be reunited at the resurrection with the body and the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions, the beingness or the personhood of the person. Your soul is not immortal. Your soul does not go to heaven. There's no place in the scriptures that say that. That's pure fantasy. It comes out of Greco-Roman, especially Greek from the Greek, uh, Greek philosophers. But your spirit does go back. And whatever state it is in heaven, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. The scriptures are vague about that. And we don't really need to know. We just need to know if our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life or not. And if they are, then we have nothing to worry about. So the term awake, as in awake from the sleep of death, like I say, is a Hebraism referring to the resurrection. David knew that Yovah created man in his own image for a purpose. If Yovah created man in his own image for a purpose, then why? Well, it's really deductive reasoning. The creation of man wasn't a pointless, dead-end endeavor on the part of the creator. David knew the heart and the character of Yovah well enough to know that Elohim had a higher purpose for man than just to live and then to die off.
David also knew that the man could have this perennial yearning for immortal life, satisfied by the fact that man was created in Yehovah's image for a reason, and that the, the reality of this fact would be a uh, fact would satisfy man's deepest yearning for immortality. That probably is the deepest yearning that human beings have: is to live forever. People don't want to; they'll fight. They'll fight to keep their life going. We all do. It's just instinctive in us. Now let's read Psalm 49:15. But Elohim does redeem my being from the power of the grave, for he does receive me. So David knew that the answer to the problem of, of, of the grave's power over man involves redemption. You know, Job had that concept, and here David has this concept. The grave has no power over those who have been redeemed. I believe that the term redemption and salvation are almost synonymous terms. The, the Tanakh or the Old Testament is more likely to use the term redemption. But salvation, and that's, that term is more commonly used in the testimony of Yeshua, the New Testament. But there, there's slight shades, variations. They're a little different from each other. But generally speaking, they're, they're pretty synonymous to my way of thinking and in, in Hebraic thought. So, um, redemption is what brings us into the presence of Yehovah to be received of Him. In other words, without redemption, one can't be received of Yehovah. You cannot come in His presence. You know that we know that sinful people cannot come into His presence. There has to be a redemption process. And of course, that's through Yeshua's death on the cross and His blood atonement and all that. All right, Isaiah 25, 8 through 9. He shall swallow up death forever, and the Master Yahweh shall wipe away tears from all faces, and take away the reproach of His people from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken, and it shall come to be said in that day, See, this is our Elohim. We have waited for Him, and He saves us. This is, our, this is Yahweh. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his deliverance. Hallelujah. So we see from the prophet Isaiah that David knew that the answer, I'm sorry, ultimately for, for the prophet uh, Isaiah, ultimately uh, the righteous, for the righteous, life will prevail over death. That's the hope. And Yehovah ultimately will wipe away man's tears that are brought about by death by the death of loved ones, or, or whatever happens in life that's of a negative nature. Those who wait on Yehovah in faith will rejoice in Yehovah's salvation through Yeshua the Messiah. In fact, interestingly, in this verse, the term salvation there at the very end of verse 9, uh, will you read that where it says salvation? Does it say that in your... Oh, oh you've already gone to the next one. I forgot where That's okay. But anyway, it uses the word salvation... And that is the term, it's in the, in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. So there is a hidden, not so hidden, if you were reading it in the, Greek, in the Hebrew, but there is, there is the term Yeshua. Right there in that salvation, or right there in that scripture talking about the resurrection, the name Yeshua. And you see that quite frequently in the, in the Tanakh. It's just there, hiding in plain sight. Okay, 20, Isaiah 26, 19. We're just adding a little more understanding as we go along here. Let your dead live together with my dead body. Let them arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is a dew of life. And let the earth give birth to the departed spirits. So, again, we're adding a little bit more information here. This is the progressive nature, the nature of progressive revelation as we go from the beginning of the scriptures to the end on the subject of resurrection. So we see that the dead shall live again. They shall arise or awake from the sleep of death. At the resurrection, the saints will come flying out of their graves in the earth. When the appointed time has come for the resurrection, the earth will no longer be able to hold the righteous dead. That's going to be an amazing sight. 
They're just going to come springing forth to meet Yeshua in the air. They cannot legally hold, the grave cannot legally hold the dead, the righteous dead any longer. They've got to come flying forth. And that's something that's kind of outside of our understanding because we are so um, temporal in our, on our understandings and, and we're so bound by time and space and by uh, the finality of life. But this is the reality on a spiritual level. And that's something that should give us great hope, especially in these dark times in which we're living. Amen? All right, let's go to Isaiah 53, verse 11. He would see the result of the suffering of his life and be satisfied. Though his knowledge, through his knowledge, my righteous servant makes many righteous, and he bears their crookedness. Now, um, many of our Bible translations do not translate this verse correctly. Uh, some, of the, some of the translations do. But there is a phrase in here, and see the light. Talking about the Messiah, uh, I think you will find that in the, um, it's not in the King James, Not I don't think it's even in the New King James, I think it's in the NIV, yeah, but this is a, and maybe some other translations, but this uh, is a, uh, this is not found in the Masoretic text, from which our, most of our Bibles are translated, but it is found in the Septuagint, and is found in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah, which are from an older version than the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text likely is a more recent version than what the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint were translated from. And along the way, as you dig into these things, you find that the rabbinic Jews twisted, thank you, twisted some of the things in the, in the Masoretic text, especially that pointed to Yeshua. Um, there was some chicanery that went on. Uh, it, it's very interesting. That's a whole other discussion, but this is one of them. The idea that the suffering servant would resurrect, see the light, as we said, that's a Hebraism for to be resurrected, was was um, they, didn't, they didn't want that in there, okay, for obvious reasons. But we see that this is a prophecy about Yeshua resurrecting from the grave. Hallelujah. And again, if this applied to him, then will it not also apply to those who have placed their faith in him and who have been buried and resurrected with him through the ritual of baptism? He was the first, Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. We see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and 23. If he is the first fruits, then there must be more to follow. And that's speaking about the saints in the first resurrection. So this should, these should be very exciting and hopeful words. And when you're going through life, and you're reading the news or whatever you're doing and you're looking at how bleak and dark everything is, this is something to cause your head to be lifted up and your hopes to rise and, and, and your faith to be strengthened. Amen? All right, Daniel 12, verses 2, 3, and then 13. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life and some to reproaches, everlasting abhorrence and those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the expanse and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever but you go your way to the end and rest and arise to your lot at the end of the days so here we see a more progressive revelation being added Daniel adds to the concept of the resurrection of the righteous, also the resurrection of the wicked. And he notes that rewards will be given to everyone. Some will go into everlasting shame. And some will go into um, everlasting glory. And he says that they, those going into everlasting glory, they will shine like the stars. Well, we know that Yeshua's face shines like the sun. 
and the sun is a, a star. And so I think this is, um, we read that in, in uh, Revelation chapter 1. And so I think this, this, this is the glory that, that the saints will have. We saw some of that glory, or I didn't, we, we didn't, but we see it recorded there on the transfiguration that Peter, James, and John saw there before Yeshua's death when he was transfigured and he, his face, he was glorified. Now, it says that the wicked will be ever, uh, resurrected into everlasting shame. It doesn't say they will be resurrected into everlasting life. In an eternal hell burning forever and ever. I do not believe in an eternal hell burning forever and ever where the wicked will be burning. This is not a Hebraic concept. This is, again a Greco-Roman pagan concept that has come into the church. And I know people will fight to the, almost to the death on this one. But um, I do believe that some people will burn a little bit longer than others. There are rewards for the wicked, levels of rewards as there are for the righteous. And again, I'm not going to make a big issue about this, but I'm just trying to come out of paganism as much as possible. And I just can't imagine a just and loving Elohim uh, burning people in a hell forever and ever, hellfire. Yes, there's going to be a is, there's going to be a death, and people make it look like separation from Elohim is death, but that's not. They really have immortal immortality. And if that if you if you're living forever, your soul is immortal. Then really, in a sense, the lie of the devil is true. You sh you shall not die. You will live forever. It may albeit maybe in hell, hellfire. But I believe that the righteous will be ashes under the, the, the uh, feet of the right. The wicked will be ashes under the feet of the righteous. And as it says, and I think it's Malachi, is it chapter 3? Somewhere in there. But regardless of whether you believe in an everlasting uh, hell or not, just do what's right and you won't have to worry about it. Amen? Just put your faith in Yeshua and walk out a righteous life and you won't have to worry about that. Now let's go to, um, let's skip down to um, Matthew 22 and 23 through, well, let's, I, we don't want to read the whole thing, Jeff. Um, let's, let me just, let me just paraphrase this. This is where they asked, the Pharisees asked him, Yeshua, you know, somebody, if, if a, a woman dies, uh, no, if a, hus a woman's husband dies and she, she, her husband dies, and her next husband dies, her next husband dies, whose husband will she be in the millennium or in the age to come? He says, look, don't you know that even as the angels don't marry, so the resurrected saints are not going to be marry, married or be given in marriage. So basically marriage and that kind of thing isn't going to be taking place. We don't have to uh, elaborate that to, on that too much. Now let's read uh, Matthew 24, 31. This is a... Now we're starting to get into a little more details about what will happen on the resurrection. Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his messengers with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. So here Yeshua explains how the saints will be gathered at the resurrection. At least this is my understanding of the scripture. Um, and he will send his angels who will uh, blow shofars, which apparently will awaken the dead from their sleep. It will call them forth. When this verse is coupled with the resurrection verses of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 1 Corinthians 15.51-52, we see this is a description of the resurrection of the saints, which we believe will take place on Yom Teruah at the, at the last trumpet, which we will hear a little bit later when we go into that part of our service. Well, we won't hear that literal last trumpet, but we will hear the Tekiah Hagadolah, which is the, which is, uh, uh, which this is speaking about, I believe. Okay, now Matthew 27, 52 through 53, moving right along. And the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the set-apart ones who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection... They went into the set-apart city and appeared to many. 
Hallelujah. I have been asked a lot of questions about this verse over the years. Probably some of you have too. Uh, why were these saints resurrected? What happened to them? Etc. 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 Look, I don't know what happened to them. I presume that they lived a little bit longer, and then when they they died, and that was the end of that. It doesn't say they went to heaven. It doesn't say that they received immortal life or they were glorified at that moment in time. But what was the point of this? Well, <laughs> sometimes the sometimes the answer is hiding in plain or you know, hiding in plain sight. I wondered about this, what was this all about? And as I was preparing this teaching, I think I came up with the answer. And like, I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but I guess, you know, you read the scriptures over and over again, and you're always coming with new revelations, so that's really good. But I really believe that this was a, um, a precursor to the first resurrection, which a lot of us have understood that. But that this was a, a proof, if you will, that the dead are going to rise. Oh, I mean, we know Lazarus resurrected and some other people in the Bible going way back uh, resurrected. But this was a bunch of people that resurrected. And this is like, this is like, a, um, like a precursor. It's like a proof that, yes, this resurrection thing really is true, not just in isolated instances where somebody was sick and fell dead and they resurrected. I think this is a confirmation, and we have... I don't know how many, uh, this, is, this passage is in Matthew. Uh, there, some of the other gospel writers might, uh, be talk, might mention this too. I don't, don't remember. But, but the, this concept of the revelation, uh, resurrection is, is real. It's not just a vain tradition or a fable. And that we can place our hope in the truth of it because it actually happened once before. That's, that's, that's a little tidbit of revelation. You're going to probably say, oh yeah, I knew that. And that's great, but I just kind of came to that revelation just a, a day or two ago. And I was kind of happy about that, you know. Anyway, now let's read Luke 14, 14. And you shall be blessed because they do not have to repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The resurrection of the righteous is a time of dispensing of spiritual rewards. The saints were rewarded in the resurrection for the good that they did during their physical lives. And the good that they did will be based on their works. Your salvation is not based on your works. Not, I could fine tune that a little bit, but I'm not going to. Generally speaking, your salvation is not based on your works. Now, you can lose your salvation. Some people don't, some people believe in once saved, always saved. I don't. But you can lose your salvation if you defiantly rebel against Elohim and you go contrary to the truth that, you're, that you know to be true, and you resist the Ruach HaKodesh to draw you back and to repent. I'm con very concerned for people that um, are raised with a knowledge of the Torah and the knowledge of Yeshua, and then they walk away from it, and they don't come back. Now, we pray that they come back, just like the prodigal son, but... Uh, it's, it's of great concern. Only Yah can judge at what point a person has committed the unpardonable sin. And thankfully, it's not my job to do, or your job. But anyway, but rewards will be given. But the rewards that are given, assuming one stays faithful to the end of their life, will be based on their works. And we have numerous passages in the Gospels and all the way through the Epistles and all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. In fact, they're in Revelation 17 or 19 verses, I don't know if it's 17 or 8. But the rewards of the righteous are based on their righteous deeds, their righteous acts. And there's a number of other places, uh, probably at least a dozen or so in the New Testament or the testimony of Yeshua alone. So, all right. So let's go to John 5, 28 through 29, moving right along. Do not marvel at this. Because the hour is coming in which all those in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have practiced evil to a resurrection of judgment. So yes, a little bit more. Um, everybody's going to be resurrected. And as we have seen, some will be blessed with eternal life and some will receive, the evil will receive condemnation. The, the wicked will be resurrected. That's at the white throne judgment. That's Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And they will come face to face 
with Yeshua at his throne of judgment. And what it says in Philippians and a couple other places, every knee shall bow, even on their way to the lake of fire. That's Philippians 2.20. So there is a resurrection for the wicked, but it'll be, they will bow their knee. They will, they will, be, they will come face to face with the judge, but they will, um, that will be uh, en route to the lake of fire. All right, John 6, 39, and then verse 40, and verse 44 and 54. This is the desire of the Father who sent me, and all he has given me I should not lose of it, but should raise it to the last day. And this is the desire of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son of, and believes in him should possess everlasting life. And I shall raise him up to the last day. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? It's really clear. Yeshua will raise up and give eternal life to those who are in, in him, or those who are his in the last day of his coming. Eternal life. We don't have eternal life. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I shall raise him up in the last day. Hallelujah. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses everlasting life. And I shall raise him up in the last day. There you go. Of course, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, these are metaphors. It's not talking about cannibalism. But to eat his flesh means to obey all of his commandments, all of his words. And to drink his blood is to be covered have our sins washed or covered in His blood, and then our sins washed away. These are the preconditions for being part of the resurrection that leads to eternal life. There's no other way. All right, John, uh, where are we at? John eleven twenty three through 26. Yeshua said to her, Your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And everyone that is living and believing in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this? So, the resurrection, or being part of the resurrection, is truly and clearly based on a relationship with Yeshua. Lazarus here was a kind of a little precursor foretaste. Yeshua loved him and uh, he had a relationship and they had a uh, they had a uh, they had a, a, um, a close relationship and of course these these people believed in the resurrection. Um, uh, and Yeshua was at the center faith in Yeshua was at the center of this. So there is no resurrection, there is no immortality outside of a relationship with Yeshua. It just won't happen. All right. Um, John, let's see. Where are we at, brother? 1419, thank you. Yet a little while, and the world no longer sees me. But you shall see me, because I live, and you shall live. You know, we have to let these words be the anchor of our soul. When we are going through all kinds of trials and difficulties, these red letters in your Bible, these words of Yeshua, need to be a rock that we can stand on in troubled times. Even as He resurrected from the grave and experienced life, so will those who are in Yeshua. Hallelujah. Now let's go into Acts 24, verses 14 and 15. And this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and in the prophets, having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. So here Paul is testifying in a court of law um, before, uh, I'm not sure who it was, I, uh, 
a king or one of the Roman magistrates. And he, this was his great hope that brought him through. I mean, this man went through things that we can't even imagine. Most of us can't. Prison and beatings and, and uh, you know, physical abuse and privations and shipwrecks. And this, this was the thing to attain to the resurrection of the dead. It, it carried him on. It propelled him through those things. He said to live is Messiah, but to die is gain. At one point in time, to, I believe that was Timothy. To him, that was a promotion. Death was a promotion because it meant eternal life. It meant the next moment you wake up, you are face to face with Yeshua, with your resurrected, glorified body at his second coming. Hallelujah. Now, Acts 26, 6 through 8. And now I stand and am judged for the expectation of the promise made by Elohim to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes earnestly serving Elohim night and day expect to attain. Concerning this expectation, O sovereign Agrippa, I am accused by the Yehudim. Why is it considered unbelievable among you if Elohim raises the dead? So there again, that was his hope, that was his faith. And he laid it right out there in front of this earthly king. And he, in a sense here, he was witnessing to him. He was preaching the gospel to him. So he, he was, Paul was one of these guys who took advantage of every opportunity to sow seeds. And uh, we should be doing the same thing. Now, the next passage... Um, this is, um, why don't you, yeah, go ahead and read it. It's in Romans chapter 8, and there's several verses here we want to read, so I'll just go ahead and let Jeff uh, finish it. And uh, when you're done, just look up at me, because I'm not turning these, just look up and I, know, and I know you're finished. And if Messiah is in you, the body is truly dead on account of sin, but the spirit is life on account of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raises Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he also raised Messiah from the dead, shall also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit dwelling in you. For the intense longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage to corruption into the esteemed freedom of the children of Elohim. For we know that all the creation groans together and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only so, but even we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For in this expectation we are saved, but expectation that is seen is not expectation. For when everyone, for when anyone sees, does he expect it? So we see here that Yeshua's disciples are willing to follow Yeshua to the grave. As Yeshua had to die to his old man, his old man was sinless, we have to die to our old carnal man, which is sinful. And, and then he will also lead us into the resurrection of life. As he resurrected from the grave, so will we. We see that the spirit of Elohim that dwells in us will give us give a life to our, our, our mortal bodies. This is the promise of physical healing here and now and ultimate healing at the resurrection. Spiritual life leading to eternal life flows to us from heaven downward to the spirit, set apart spirit into our human spirit and then into our mortal bodies. It's like a river of life. Our spirit, small s, is connected to his spirit, capital S, the Ruach, and then that life flows down into us through our mind, will, and emotions, our soul, and into our physical bodies. And many times we experience physical healing here and now. And that's a whole other discussion. But ultimately, ultimately, 
that at the glorification of the resurrection, we will experience the full regeneration of our bodies. If we are in Yeshua and we have persevered and continued to the very end, we will have that, uh, that river life from heaven will, will, will impart to us eternal life. Uh, this is our earnest expectation that brings about our adoption. There's that term, adoption. He uses it. Um, we're grafted into the olive tree of Israel, but we're adopted into the family of Elohim. Some people get those terms mixed up. The term adoption is used about, I think, about five times in Paul's writings, and every time he uses it as, as an expression to be brought into the family of Elohim. That's in verse 15. And then as a result, we are transformed, we are transformed into his children and joint heirs with Messiah. That sounds pretty good. Joint heirs. Yeshua became an heir, if you will, to everything the Father gave him. And Elohim wants to give us that also. I don't know what that's going to be like, but I know it's pretty good. And it's, there's nothing on this earth that compares to it. So why would I want to strive for spend a lot of my energy on things, physical things of this earth that are here today, gone tomorrow, when I could put most of my energy towards spiritual things that are going to be lasting forever. We also, if we suffer with Yeshua, we will also be glorified with him. Verse 17. Our resurrection is the glorification and redemption of our mortal bodies. Verse 21. And this is the hope of our salvation. Verse 24. This is a hope that we have to hang on to. The resurrection. This is the hope. And Elohim has given us a way to attain to that hope. The devil at the Garden of Eden tried to circumvent that and give man a way around that. But it was a lie. It actually led to death. There are many, many ways that lead to death. Even as there are 360 degrees on a compass, but there's only one degree that leads to, true, to north. Elohim has given us that one degree that leads to north. And it's found here in the Bible, and it's through a relationship with Yeshua, and walking and loving Him by keeping His Torah commandments. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. 6, 14? 6, 14, yes. And Sorry. Elohim who raised up the Master shall also raise us up through His power. So there you have it. If, if Yeshua resurrected from the dead, which we know He did, we are assured and promised that we too will be resurrected. That, what happened to him will happen to us. That is a basis and a foundation for our faith. Now, I'm not going to have Jeff read this whole thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 58. But uh, I'll just summarize it real quickly. The res resurrection of the dead, this is the great resurrection chapter, I guess you could call it that. The resurrection of the dead is a main cornerstone of our faith. Verses 12 through 19. When we are baptized for the remission of sins, we're baptized in the hopes of the resurrection, even as we were symbolically resurrected out of the watery grave at the time of our baptism. Verse 29. So when we, are res when we go... When we are baptized for the remission of sins, we go in that watery grave and we come back up again. That's a picture of identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. What are the mechanics of the resurrection? All around us in nature, and Paul goes in to give an illustration, all around us in nature we see quiet witnesses of how the resurrection works. And he uses the example of the seed on a tree or a plant that has to die first before it can bring forth life. It's a miracle. It's an amazing thing. But we see that literally in all the plants or most of the plants around us. That's verses 35 to 38. 
Then Paul goes on to illustrate that we are, that there are levels of rewards in the resurrection. And we've seen that. Daniel talked about that <coughs> in some other places. Some people will have more glorious rewards than others, verses 40 through 42. As we learn from other scriptures, one's level of rewards will be based on one's good works during their physical lives. Yeshua, the second Adam, is this, at the center of our hope in the resurrection. Verses 45 through 49. Paul never got too far away from the centrality of the gospel message anywhere in any of his writings and the focus on Yeshua. Those who are alive at Yeshua's second coming, Paul goes on to say, will die and be resurrected to glorification in a split second at the, second, at the last trumpet. Verse, verses 50 through 54. Through Yeshua, we have victory over sin, the wages of which is death. Verses 54 through 57. And this hope keeps us steadfast and immovable in our faith as we are moving forward in our spiritual walk in Yeshua. Verse 58. That's where he ends this discussion. So, that's a beautiful picture, and he adds even more insights into this. Uh, in this passage, into the concept of the resurrection. Uh, we won't read 2 Corinthians 4.14, but here's another passage. It says, basically, as Yehovah uh, resurrected Yeshua, so he will resurrect the saints. It's another, another promise. that What happened to Yeshua, that was a precursor or a foretaste of what will happen to us. Hallelujah. And then... Go ahead and read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5, please. For we know that if the tent of our earthly house is destroyed, we have a building from Elohim, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. For indeed, this we groan, longing to put on our dwelling, which is from heaven, so that having put, put it on, we shall not be found naked. For indeed, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we wish to put it off, but to be put on the other, so that what is to die might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this same purpose is Elohim, who has given us the spirit of a pledge and of what is to come. Hallelujah. So Elohim is preparing a spiritual body for us. Hallelujah. It's, it's, from, it's going to be from heaven. It's going to come down from heaven, or I don't know how that's all going to work, but I believe it. Uh, and uh, right now we're living in earthly habitations, which are like clay vessels or like a tent. Paul uses some different analogies here. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy living in these bodies. It's a burden. It, we groan. We have aches and pains, and it's it's just really a pain sometimes. You know, we got to feed them. We got to bathe them. We've got to uh, we've got to uh, nurture them. We've got to rest them. You know, right now I'm I'm a little bit under the weather. Um, I just my body's fighting something, and I'm like, where did that come from? You know, he's giving me the strength. Um, I probably should be home resting. I'm not that bad off, but I'd rather, I mean, part of me, my flesh part would rather be resting at home right now. My spirit man would be, rather be here. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. You know, we all struggle with these things. You know, you get a headache, or it's that time of the month, or, or whatever. You know, you get older, and, and things happen, and, you know, it's just, you know, there's something more to look forward to. You know, when you're young, you don't think about those things too much. I mean, you're, 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 uh, you are um, um, invincible. Your life will go on forever. You know, the other day, I was looking, I was going through some pictures that my mom gave me. Uh, I was looking at my senior portraits. And uh, well, they were taken 37 years ago or something. And there's one picture, I, I couldn't believe it. I can't believe how my oldest child and my oldest daughter looks just like me in that senior portrait. I go like, oh my, scary. But anyway, uh, I wish she could have, you know, didn't, anyway, maybe, <laughs> anyway, she's beautiful. But I, I look at this, I go like, wow, 
That was, I was 18 at the time. That was so long ago. It's like a different person. And I'm 55, uh, be 56 here pretty soon. I'm like, where did life go? And I'm looking forward to the resurrection. I'm looking forward. I love my wife and my family and my kids. But, you know, life is a pain sometimes. It's a burden. You know, just, I had to take, you know, I, I had my cell phone on me. And, and I, I kept getting calls. And on the Shabbat, I don't take any calls unless it's somebody from my, in my contacts list because I don't want to talk to a client. I, I shut my business down on Shabbat. I do not do my work. Well, it was a client. I, well, I, I didn't know who it was. But they called like 10 times. They're like, what is this? An emergency? Would a tree fall on their house? And so, I mean, well, they can call somebody else. And so uh, they just kept calling. And I, I, I had on vibe mode. Finally, I just, I, like, I don't want to even feel that because I know it's a customer trying to get a hold of me. And I stuck it in my pack over there, my computer bag, because I didn't want to be reminded of this. And then I, I was just curious, so I listened to their voicemail. It was some stupid thing that they're all wigged out about, and they want to get a hold of me now, and, and this and that. And, and it's like, it just kind of like, I don't even want to think about this physical, earthly stuff on the Shabbat. Uh, we're on a high holy day like Yom Teruah. And we all go through these things. This is the last day. I put all that stuff totally, it could be a million miles away as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so I'm looking forward to the resurrection. You know, it will present its own challenges, but it's going to be better than this. I can tell you that. Hallelujah. Ruling and reigning with Yeshua and his kingdom. No more New World Order and all that nonsense. Babylon the Great, pew, down the toilet. Captives set free. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, let's, read, uh, let's read Philippians 3, 10 through 11 and 21. To know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if somehow I might attain to the resurrection from the dead, who shall change our lowly body to be conformed to his esteemed body, according to the working by which he is able even to bring all under his control? So we must push forward in our spiritual walk, following the example of Yeshua of enduring suffering here and now. Some of you are going through some really great trials. We're praying for you. This is part of the human condition. But we've got to keep our eyes on Yeshua and push forward. And He will lead us into eternal life. If we endure the suffering here now, even as Yeshua did, and then He was set at the right hand of Elohim in heaven, of His Father, so we will arrive at the goal of the resurrection where our lowly earthly bodies will be transformed to be like Yeshua's glorious body. Look, what else does the world have to offer that's any better than this? Ask yourself. If this is all a joke and a lark, which I don't believe it is, I, I lay, I'll lay my life on this one. But what what else, what else is, where is there a more glorious picture of anything than the gospel message? What am I going to become a Buddhist monk? I'm going to become a Hindu uh, Swami or Maharishi and, and go home and look at my navel and contemplate something out there somewhere? I mean, really now? I'm going to run for president? Give me a break. What am I going to pursue money so I can become miserable trying to figure out how to keep my stocks going in the stock market when everything's going down the toilet? What am I going to do? Go out and, and, and just have sex with everybody so I can get STDs and be a playboy and, and, and get, reap all that misery? Uh, my heart just, you know, all these emotional turmoil I go through and have a miserable life. 
I mean, we could go down the list. What am I going to put my faith in the New World Order? Or the United Nations? Or this philosophy or that philosophy? Or what have you? What else is there? What am I going to become a drug addict and live in an altered state of consciousness all the time? Or drown my sorrows in booze? So every time I wake up, i got to take more because I'm so miserable? Or am I just going to eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow my, I die, just live my life as if there's no tomorrow and have fun with my friends and go here and go there and do this and that? And meanwhile, my heart's crying outside, inside of me, like wondering, what is the deeper meaning of life? Why was I put here? Am I going to be a rebel and rebel against Elohim against authority, against this and that, and take on the whole world and change the world to fit my, what I think is right? I tried that once. I went to Europe for a year to study uh, my junior year of college. And I was going to change Europe. And I thought, you know, I only knew the American perspective. And I lived with a Swiss family. I, went, I was in Switzerland. It took me about six months. This older gentleman I lived with, I lived with an older couple, um, I realized that I was not going to change their mentality. And I realized that actually they've got some pretty good viewpoints and it's different than mine. But you know what? I could learn. It took me six months to get that through my head. Well, I was only 20. I turned 21 there. So I you know, was a real big know-it-all in those days. You know, ever been there? Thankfully, I got over that phase in my life. And the older you get, the realize the more you don't know and the more humbling it is. But I tried to change Europe. <laughs> I came back to the United States with a, with a much healthier viewpoint and a broader viewpoint and realized that different cultures have different viewpoints and, you know, it's not the almighty American on everything. And now I'm thinking that less and less, all the more, as, as I see the way this country is going. Anyway. I digress. Second uh, Timothy one verse ten. We skip something. Oh, probably. First Thessalonians. Do we do that one? No, I think we did. So let me just say, this is our great hope and comfort: the resurrection of the dead. There's nothing better. Yeah, First Corinthians four fourteen and sixteen. There's nothing better that I know of to put my faith in. Huh? You want to skip those fourteen and sixteen? Let me see here. No, I want to read 14, 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 14, 4, 14 and 16. That's the other great um, resurrection passage that we want to read. Yeah, please. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yeshua. Because the Master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of a chief messenger, and with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Hallelujah. Well, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't even need to comment on that. 2 Timothy 1.10. Actually, let me just, let's just bypass that one. This particular passage, basically just the light of the gospel message, reveals the truth of our victory over death resulting in immortal life. It's all there. The gospel message, victory over death, the wage of sin is death, leading to immortal life. That's the whole message. It's all right there. Go ahead, you're there. You may as well read it. Well, I already went to oh, the you already went to the next now. one. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> then Hebrews 6, 2. Of the teaching of immersion and of laying on the hands of the resurrection of the dead and the everlasting judgment. So here, this actually, verse one, verses 1 and 2, uh, the writer of Hebrews identifies the, the several foundational uh, doctrines or truths of, the, um, of our faith. And the resurrection of the dead is... Is, is right in there. Along with eternal judgment. Look, eternal judgment. Think about it. Eternal judgment is not a bad thing. If you've done what's right, you're going to be eternally judged and given rewards forever. Eternal life. If you've done what's wrong, 
you have not obeyed Elohim, you've been a rebel and, and, and you have not repented of your sins, then you'll be eternally judged and you'll be condemned. That's damnation or condemnation. <clears throat> this judgment thing is really important and it goes hand in hand with the concept of the resurrection. Alrighty, so let's now end this discussion by reading Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, and in 13 through 15. And Revelation I, 20, 4 through 6, and in 13 through 15. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And the lives of those who had been beheaded because of the witness they bore to Yeshua, and because of the <coughs> word of Elohim, and who did not worship the beast, nor his image, and did not receive his mark upon their foreheads, or upon their hands. <coughs> and they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years, and the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death possesses no authority over these, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. For those who get through the end times without worshiping the image of the beast and taking his mark will inherit eternal life and rule and reign with Yeshua for a thousand years. Hallelujah. That's our hope. That's during the millennium. Now, the first resurrection is mentioned twice in this passage, the only place in the Bible where it's mentioned. This refers to the resurrection of the righteous at Yeshua's second coming. Now, it stands to reason, it's just logical, if there's a first resurrection, there must be a second resurrection. Now, there's some debate among Bible teachers when the second resurrection is. Uh, the Bible doesn't really specifically state, but there will be people who will be alive during the millennium, uh, phys the physical people that, that survived the, the things, of the, the great traumatic things uh, of, the, of the end time judgments mentioned in the book of Revelation, and they survive into the millennium. In fact, there's going to be, at, at that time, I believe this is when uh, the, the second exodus is largely going to take place, after the captives have been set free, when Babylon the Great falls, as you should, which Yeshua will destroy the second coming. We see that in Revelation 18 and 19. And then the captives will be set free and many will be coming back to the land of Israel, uh, of, this, of this lost sheep of the house of Israel, the scattered tribes. So there will be a lot of people on this earth who will be alive. And the saints will be ruling and reigning over them as kings and priests and teaching them Yehovah's ways. And these people will be coming up to Yerushalayim to keep the feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles and others. And a lot of things be going on, will be going on during this time. So, and people will be coming to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, we will be evangelizing them and discipling them. And, and then they will die and have their uh, time to be resurrected also, at some point in time, now some people think it will happen, and again, we, I, I don't find any scriptures that really explicitly state this, uh, so I could be wrong about well, what I'm about to say, but some people think that they might be, um, once they die during the millennium, they will then, if they, if they, at their name was found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be resurrected immediately into glorif glorification. Others, and I, I tend to think it will probably happen at the White Throne Judgment, um, but it doesn't really say that either, but there's a hint of that there in that passage in Revelation talking about those whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I don't know, but th if there's a first resurrection, there's got to be a second one. And it's a resurrection of life. And that's what he's talking about here, the first resurrection. Now some people think, well, the second resurrection is the resurrection of the, of the wicked. And, and that, well, where was their first resurrection then? So I think this is talking about the resurrection of the righteous. And when exactly that occurs, I, I don't know. But we know that it will happen. And then, of course, the unregenerate wicked, those who died in their sins from the beginning of the world until the, till the white throne judgment will be resurrected, and they will appear before King Yeshua. All will be judged for their works. Those found written in the book of life will inherit eternal life. 
and those not found in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. So those are the two options, the two alternatives that we have. Life or death. The highway to heaven or the highway to hell, so to speak. And that's really, each person has to make that choice. And for those who have made that choice, your great hope is the resurrection of the dead, which Yom Teruah today is a picture of. Amen. Hallelujah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem be'himatzov kerabu. Shem behim matzot kerabu.